So let's go ahead and talk about it, right? The gospel. And now I think it's important for me to kind of break down the gospel, open up your hearts a little bit, and kind of go through it like through three major questions. And so number one, who are you? Right? I think it's important. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So number one, you're not a perfect individual. Number two, if you think about Galatians, I mean, not Galatians, if you think about Genesis, right, and you see the fall of Adam and Eve, right, you see that that's when everything started to go awry, right? This, this, this thing started to twist, okay? And so we are descendants of Adam and Eve. Now, we are not guilty of what they did, right? Adam and Eve did a sin. We're not guilty of what they did, but what happens is what they did has a direct effect on the rest of humanity, right? For example, when you read um, Exodus chapter 20, and you see that, you know, I'm visiting the iniquity upon the children about the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. It's kind of like if you think about it like a mob boss and he has a family, what he does has direct implications on his family, which means, for example, the mob boss may do a drug deal and it goes bad. And so some other mob boss comes and kills his family. Now, his family wasn't guilty for what he did, but they suffered the repercussions. And so what we are are individuals who are suffering the repercussions of this. Now, we're all guilty. We've all sinned. I know a lot of people like to say, oh, well, if I was Adam and Eve, I would not have bitten. The That's not true. You would have. As a matter of fact, you sin on a daily basis. So you're guilty of your own sins. But what happens is because of death coming into the world, that's what we're suffering. So again, who are you? You are an individual who has sinned against God and you fall short. Now, the Greek word here for fall short is husterio, and it means to be deficient, to lack, to suffer need, right? To be in want, to be the worst. So that word husterio is a perfect description about us, right? Without Christ, we are totally destitute. So what have we done in order to receive these repercussions? Now, this is important because if you don't pay attention to what we have done and this specific verse in context, right, a lot of cults will try to kind of switch this up. And this is kind of like a peek into what he's doing. He says, "For what have you done? For the, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. So the payment for what you have done as a human being is death. You have rightfully earned death, right, because you have done a certain work. But watch how this switches here. And some people don't pay attention to here. He says, but the free gift of God, notice it's not the wage of God. God's not giving you a wage of something you've earned, right? So the first one is something you've earned. You've earned death. You've broken God's law. You've broken God's commands and you've earned this. This is your wage. This is your rightful payment. But the free gift, which is not a payment, right, of God is eternal life in who? Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ, not something that we earn. Already stated in Romans 6.23. Now, if you're interested in a study on Romans, I've done an entire study on the entire book of Romans. I went through it verse by verse. So if you're interested in that, go to my channel and go to the playlist, the Romans uh, commentary or Bible study. Make sure you guys check that out. Uh, and my moderators, if you want to drop the link to that Roman study, do so so that people can have access to it in the chat. Okay, so... Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, what happens as a result? We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. A lot of the time, we like to boast and proclaim about all the good works that we've done, whether they are following the commands of Christ or following the laws of the land, whichever one this applies to. Any righteous deed, anything that you do that's good, right, is like a polluted garment, right? And then he says, and that polluted garment is, here we go, get a little bit explicit. It's a, wom a woman's menstrual rag, right? It's pretty, pretty explicit, but it's true. So this polluted garment, that's what it's talking about. So whatever your righteous deeds are, when you bring it to God as a justification for you being righteous, it's like you bringing him a dirty menstrual rag. Very important, okay? And then he says, we all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. So our sin, like the wind, takes us away. But the question I always like to ask people is take us away from what? Well, we all know that sin cannot dwell in the presence of God. So your sin pulls you away from God, right? That's one way to explain to help people grasp and understand. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10, okay, I think is extremely important that we get the order 
right. Now, so many works-based salvation cults like to build on the premise that we are made righteous or are justified in God's sight or gain favor or are in right standing with God based on us keeping the laws that he established, right? And they like to use that. And so they put the cart before the horse. This is why it's so important that we not only quote Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, which is so commonly done, but also quote 10 because it really pulls it full circle for us to grasp this. So he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So let's walk through it. Number one. We have been saved by grace and through faith. Faith in what? Just nebulous, you know, I just believe, or is it faith in something specific? Well, the Greek word here is pistis, which is extremely important, and that's what the word faith means, is belief in based on a kind of uh, a litany of evidence, a whole bunch of evidence. For example, I trust my wife or I have faith in my wife because she has shown herself to be trustworthy. Not because she hasn't, or because I'm just blindly believing that she's trustworthy. No, it's because of her acts. This is why it's so important for you and I to read the Bible, because we learn about God, and we trust Him more because we get to see why, right? So we have evidence for why we believe. So it is through faith or trusting in Jesus. All right, the next portion says, and this is not your doing, which means... The work that Jesus did is not something you did to earn eternal life. So faith is not a work. It, it is the gift of God. So what is the gift of God? Well, his salvation, his good announcement, the king is coming, this proclamation that you can be saved apart from your ability to try to make yourself righteous. He says, not a result of works. It is the gift of God so that no one may boast. In other words, this gospel is freely given. This message that you receive is Jesus Christ dying for you, right? Giving up his life so that you may be saved. And this wasn't a result of your doing so that nobody could boast. And what you'll see a lot of the time, and this is a telltale sign in any religious cult who are working on a works-based salvation method, is that a lot of them, whether they proudly proclaim it, whether it's subjective, right? The whole thing that they're doing is boasting about their works. Here's how you can tell. Hey, do you keep the law? What law? Well, the laws in the Old Testament. No. Well, that means you're going to hell and you're not going to make it in the kingdom of heaven because you're breaking God's law. That is a boast because what that implies is that they are keeping the law. And as we'll discover, as we walk through Galatians, they don't even keep the law they, proc they proclaim to keep. Okay. Then it says, created in Christ Jesus for, and then it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ. So, now that we've placed our faith in Christ, we believed in his completed work, we are his workmanship now. Now he uses us for his glory, right? To bring more people to the gospel. And then he says, for good works. Now, where does works fall in? Is it at the beginning or is it at the end, right? Is at the end, right? You can't put the cart before the horse. A lot of works-based salvation cults say, okay, you have to do good works and then all this salvation comes. But with a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ is, we are saved first by his completed work. And because of that, we do good works. So good works and keeping God's commands as it is in context with scripture is extremely important. And that's how we, you and I, can actually see on whether or not a person is actually walking out their faith. Now, I would advise you to read James chapter 2. Uh, I also have a study on James chapter 2, if you're interested in that, that kind of works this out even a little more. Then he says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What? The good works. So the good works come after we have been saved. Okay, let's go on to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is extremely important. I don't know if you guys really noticed this uh, when you read 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, so in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 21 to 22, this is how you kind of crush the idea that we've earned anything. Okay, and so let's walk through it nice and slow and take our time. It says, for as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. I don't know if you've read this verse before. If you have, sometimes we tend to kind of just gloss over things. But this is extremely important. So make sure in your notepads you guys are writing this down. 
for as by a man came death. So because of a man, we die. Death came into the world. Who is this man he is speaking of? Well, I told you earlier, it's Adam. Then he says, by a man has also come the resurrection of that the dead. So now that we inherit death and we're going to die as human beings unless Christ comes back, but there's also this other man that has also done something that gives us the resurrection, the resurrection of the dead or eternal life. And this is Jesus Christ. So notice is the second Adam, right? You have Adam, we inherit death because of his disobedience and we can inherit eternal life by Jesus Christ's obedience, right? So you see how they're just, they're kind of put at the bookends. All right. So verse 22, it says, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, this is why I think is important. So you see, I've highlighted as in and so also because it's extremely important. So basically it means for in the same way, Adam died. It says for as in Adam all die. So in the same way that Adam has given us death and we inherited it, right? The same way we're going to inherit this eternal life. Now, how do we inherit it? Well, ask yourself a question. What did I do to inherit death? Right? Did you earn death? Well, of course, by your sin, but death came into the world by what? Not your work, but Adam's work. So how does eternal life come into the world? By Christ's completed work. See, it has nothing to do with our ability to, to save ourselves. The same way that we inherited death is the same way we inherit life by someone else's work.